acceptable. It depends. Sorry to go there, but you're talking about a jury, and you're talking about you know advancing arguments of contributory liability. Now, the law aspect of it for for a couple things, which we're going to get in for websites. All right, when you're the website and you're posting it, are you liable for things that are posted on there? The, the speech aspect of it. Typically not. We're going to get into that aspect of it because basically it's the same thing as First Amendment and the publisher. You're not the publisher of it. The people posting at it, they're the publisher of it. Now, there's some exceptions on that in terms of infringing information, things of that nature, and we're going to talk to some of those exceptions. When you start becoming interactive to that information that's published on there, uh, so jumping ahead, there's a case, uh, the Fair Housing uh, case, against uh, a site that was setting up for roommates. And it's the typical aspect. Post you know, what you want for your roommate, and you can use the site to, to find a roommate. Well, on this one, if they just done that and let the people post what they want, they would not be liable for the infringing material. And, and, and this one basically violated the Fair Housing Act in that you can't discriminate when you're putting it up there. I mean, what they created was drop-down boxes with questions. You know, seeking only cat lovers, you know, dog lovers, um, computer hackers only, um, you know. And as you can imagine, Fair Housing Act, anti-discrimination, they started having some of those aspects that crossed the line, and they shut down the website saying you violated the Fair Housing Act for that. Interactive, they were responsible for some of that content. So now, if I'm going after, again, the site that's got the malicious aspect of it, are you just posting it? Have you modified any of it And from that aspect? Now, right off the bat, who might, okay, this is, you know, law, law practice 101. I get harmed by it. Who am I going to file suit after? Who said that? Stand up here. You want, um, he said deepest pockets. You want the magic empire, Celine Dion, Gloria. You got the magic empire. There you go. Outstanding. <laughs> deepest pockets. I'm a Chrysler kid. I grew up in Michigan. My dad worked for Chrysler. Where does Chrysler get sued all the time? It's, um, geez, I can't even remember, I'm from Oakland County. Wayne County, it's Detroit, downtown Detroit. Why? Very poor, deep pockets, let's give a little money out to the little guy. So you're going to sue the deep pocket. So if I'm suing this for the website, I'm suing the website, and I'm going to, through discovery, try to find out who also posted that malicious code in there and haul them in too. So I'm going to put them all in. Now, who's going to be responsible? I've got theories of contributory liability that I can throw out there. Again, contributory liability aspects of life means who's going to share most of the responsibility. Uh, I always tease my wife when I was uh, you know, clerking for a judge, there was a product liability case over a bad haircut. Um, what it was was the gal was working on a, 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 a turret drill. And the turret drill basically has about five different drills, and it rotates around to create a product. And obviously, you've got the safety mechanisms on there, so you can't be close as you're pulling it down. And being a good company, they jerry-rigged it so they could work faster. And the gal's hair got caught in a turret drill, and it scalped her. Contributory liability. I was watching the guy's closing arguments, one of the best ones I've ever seen. The guy was really smooth. They were suing for like $2 million for a bad haircut. Um, and he goes and he said, look, if you believe that my client's liable... It's not for the full $2 million. And he goes into our earnings and everything, and he goes, we might be liable for a certain percentage. And that's what the verdict came back to. Basically, the gal who got the haircut was liable for 97.5%, and the company was liable for 2.5%. But the verdict was $4 million. So when you're talking numbers, that's the aspect. So if you're setting up a website, you know, your first defense is going to be, again, the aspect of kind of free speech. I'm just here letting them post whatever they want. I'm not liable for that. You know, code is speech, several cases have said, so I'm just going to post it, and that's it. Now, is that going to prevent you from being liable and going into court? Not if I was the attorney. I mean, again, back to the deep pockets aspect of life. All right, interactive aspects, and that's kind of what we're talking about with that. This particular case, um, again, it was not an interactive website, so they weren't hauled into court. Hagesmith, this is a criminal case. Um, these are the online pharmaceuticals. Um, the aspect on this one was um, a Stanford freshman uh, online ordered a bunch of Prozac. Um, you can kind of see where this is going to go uh, by the, the bottom line there. The way it works is 
He orders it through JRB Health Solutions, a Florida company. They have subcontracted with a Colorado physician to fill the prescription. They then get a Mississippi-based pharmacy to issue the prescription. So we're talking, and it goes to California. So you got a whole bunch of things going on here. Kid dies, and San Mateo is going to bring a criminal case against the doctor, not for so much the death, but for practicing without a license in the jurisdiction uh, on it. Now, his whole thing is, I'm, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't practicing in the jurisdiction. I wasn't even within the jurisdiction. Again, going back to that minimum context that we were talking about before. In this criminal case, they, the motion came up, kind of a, a preliminary motion to dismiss, so he doesn't have to go forward and show up in California to the criminal prosecution. And the court held here, by a preponderance of the evidence, it is foreseeable that when you issue a prescription, it's going to go to several different states. So it's foreseeable that you need to do more than just be filling the prescription without any research to find out who it's going to and the context that go with that. So they're going to haul him into California to stand trial uh, on this on practicing in California without a license. Again, his big thing at all times, I was in Colorado, and basically it's called constructive presence, and they're going to bring him in. I bring this up as a quick hitter. Um, in the matter of searching Yahoo, um, with the Patriot Act, uh, which everyone no comment. Um, the Patriot Act modified some of the uh, search requirements. It basically gave jurisdictions the capability to issue a search warrant, uh, which is good across all jurisdictions. And this actually was the case. In Arizona, they uh, issued a search uh, of Yahoo in California and said, yep, you can uh, go and take this, and it's valid, so we don't have to worry about that. Web-based software. Um, kind of a little bit going back to the hacking site. Um, we've, many of us have used TurboTax um, or different products such as that. In this particular case, uh, the company was a bankruptcy software um, the website. Um, and this kind of stands for the aspect of watching that sales puffery, what you are advertising uh, and what you're actually doing. Because their interactive site, um, with, combined with the sales puffery, had them violating and practicing law without a license on this. Um, and that's what it is. The decision, as the court says, stands for an overly expert program coupled with poorly chosen statements can expose the vendor to uh, a claim of practicing without a license. The kind of difference on this one, well, again, TurboTax kind of helps you plug in your, decide to choose which forms you want. And that did, this one did too. Um, specifically, you put the information in, it chose what forms to file for the bankruptcy. Plus, with the uh, words they used here for the sales puffery, uh, basically said, nope, uh, you're practicing uh, law without a license and we're going to let you be sued for that. This goes back to the web page aspect. Universal Communications was suing Lycos because an anonymous posting on it uh, defamed and slandered them, saying that their financial state wasn't as good as it should be. Uh, they sued Lycos basically for it. And uh, again, the court said, nope, under Communication Decency Act, they're just posting the information. They're not liable for it, for what's being stated in there. So you can't bring a lawsuit against them on that one. So, you know, again, can you be sued for that? Yeah, absolutely. For the hacking site where you're inviting code to come in, um, will they prevail? Um, again, uh, everyone in this room knows several different cyber lawyers. Um, so if I were you, I'd be getting uh, Mr. Carr out of George Washington University or kind of like what I'm the warm-up warm act for, uh, Ms. Granick out of Stanford to represent you uh, to make sure uh, you're not liable for your hacking website. We already talked about the fair housing case uh, on this one. And again, this was more interactive. Instead of just posting the information, they had the drop-down boxes for you know, specific categories of roommates that you were looking for. So again, this violated the Communication Decency Act, made them liable for what they were, you know, they were posting there. I, the difference being they were responsible for some of the content that was actually coming up while they were doing it. All right, let's turn to some of the fun cases that you want to, you know, the seizure of your computer equipment uh, is always a, a hot topic. Seizing it, how you seize it, search methods. This case, in Ray Forgiono, um, your equipment's going to be seized. Uh, you know, is it at home? Is it at the office? It's a fun aspect. 
I like this case because basically it's the old aspect of college students, one's harassing another college student. So that college student goes to the system administrator of the school, they kind of find the IP addresses, they turn it over to the cops, cops do a little investigation, find out the IP address belongs to the student, go to the house with a search warrant to seize all computer equipment. So they seize all the computer equipment, to include grandma's TurboTax and everything that's up there, and they take everything out of the house. So the parents, of course, file a suit to get their equipment back, saying, hey, okay, so my kid did this, great, can I have my equipment back? And the court said, no, based on the totality of the circumstances, the search warrant said all computer equipment. I don't know that they're using the computer in the basement to cause the stalking and harassment. They might be using grandma's computer up in the guest bedroom to do it. So we're going to take everything and we're going to hold on to everything. You cannot get it back. Getting the data back, you know, that's the fun aspect of the data back um, from that when you're, you know, getting mirror images and things of that nature. And this goes into the search methods, which is kind of down the road. Um, one of the hugest complaints that I've heard of is the processing time for certain three little agencies to um, process an image and search the computer, and that it's long. Um, now, that has happened. Cases have come in, and courts have told those particular law enforcement agencies, search the damn computer or return it by this date. So they have occurred, and that's the aspect of it. You know, again, your attorney has got to be savvy enough to say, this thing needs to be searched by a certain time frame or it has to be returned, and that's the process that they're going to pursue. Question. Uh, the question was, can I get the data back on that one? So sorry about that. I did the answer before that. Sir? Okay, so if I've got the question right on this one, the question is looking between the large enterprise against the small consumer because when you want to search or see something from the large enterprise, you can't take that away as opposed to from the small com consumer that you can take that away a lot easier. Is that correct? All right. Obviously, from that aspect, you know, with law enforcement and law enforcement investigations, you're going to be working on different aspects of the method to do that ahead of time hopefully, um, from that aspect. So when you're talking about large, what I've seen so far with large enterprises, what they do is they go in and, to some extent, with a very overwhelming team, hopefully, to go in there and image what they need to preserve that aspect. Some large corporations, again, have actually had things seized from that. End. Small consumers, so, so who's more strong and weak here? Yeah, your large enterprises, again, personal opinion. Uh, and I've seen this more from other practice areas. You know, large corporations always fare, always, have a tendency to fare better than mom and pop. So mom and pop can't reference another case that's been applied to a large Mom and pop, questions, can mom and pop reference another case that's been, absolutely. You know, and that's what you're, you know, again, we're, we're talking, you know, this is the, the, you know, law school aspect of the, the question here. Mom and pop, what resources do mom and pop have to know who are the attorneys I'm supposed to get? You know, because again, mom and pop, you know, for fear that mom and pop are running, you know, the small bakery of the deli. And, you know, teenage son is, whoops, caught up. And, and they come in and they take everything. You know, what are, what are typically mom and pop going to know? Okay, I, I've incorporated, you know, to look.